I mean, it's okay to change their mind because it's a novel virus and, and you learn new things. What was outrageous about it was to treat the scientific inquiry as this monolithic thing that's written right. in stone. And so if you go, if you run afoul of it, then your voice needs to be censored because frankly, you don't, you're not following the science, Dave. Um, that's the attitude. And, and, and the, also the fact that questions that were ultimately philosophical questions or policy questions, okay, we have this virus, what degree of restrictions is appropriate? Are there other goods besides just preserving life against the novel coronavirus that we should preserve? Those aren't scientific questions. Mm -hmm. And yet a kind of expert class by trying to shoehorn it all into, they, they basically uh, uh, tried to push their policy preferences and their philosophical assumptions as scientific claims, which of course they're not. You know, uh, a, a statesman or a stateswoman dealing with something like the virus has to weigh various things, not just one virus, but also other sources of threat to human life, like loneliness and depression and, and joblessness. <laughs> Joining me today is the op-ed editor of the New York Post and the author of The Unbroken Thread, Discovering the Wisdom of Tradition in an Age of Chaos, Sorab Amari. Welcome to The Rubin Report. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for having me. I am really glad to have you. And I read the book this weekend and I really thought it was fascinating because in, in many ways, we come sort of from different worlds, sort of from a different school of thought. But I think that the conclusions that you came to in this book are very similar to the conclusions that I came to in my book, that I think Ben Shapiro has come around to, you actually reference him at the top of the book, that Jordan Peterson has come to, and uh, I'm, in, I'm looking forward to chatting with you, but before we do anything, I know you wanted to address the room that you're in right now. You're not being held hostage, are you? Yes, not being held hostage, not being interrogated by some Eastern European police state. It's just that I, my, my own apartment uh, is um, uh, filled with rambunctious kids. So therefore, a, a neighbor of mine is, who doesn't live in his own apartment, really, so it's a kind of dilapidated place, is kind enough to let me use his place, hence the weird wire in the back. It's the best we can do under, under COVID circumstances, so bear with me. That is the story, and you're sticking to it. And you are doing this from New York City. So you're in crazy New York, I'm in crazy LA. How, how's life in New York right now? I think it's getting a little bit livelier. Um, the mask insanity is, um, you could see people not wearing masks outside anymore, which is a relief. Um, but you know, as you know, uh, in terms of crime and uh, disorder, it's just growing. Yeah. So before we get into the specifics of the book, I'm curious, what, what really made you write the book and, and really focus on these 12 questions that we're gonna, we're gonna go through each one and, and discuss each one, but what really brought you to this conclusion that this book had to be written now? I mentioned to you right before we started that the subtitle, In an Age of Chaos, that was about to be in the subtitle of my next book, and then your book literally came across my desk and we changed it all together, but, but we are in a time of chaos. Yeah, so in my case, it's a book I wrote for my son, Max. He's now four years old. When I started writing it, he was two. Um, and I'm really worried about the kind of man that our contemporary cultural political arrangements will chisel out of him. Um, he's named after a great Catholic saint who is St. Maximilian Kolbe, who is was canonized and is famous for having um, chosen to die in place of someone else at Auschwitz. And to me, that... Uh, his Kolbe sacrifice exemplified an account of freedom, it's really an older account of freedom, which defines freedom as being willing to limit yourself even unto death, that accepting limits, accepting sacrifice, accepting duty. And my fear is that my Max, if just left to our own culture, will inherit a very different account of freedom, one that defines being free as just kind of keeping your options open and getting ahead in life in very materialistic terms. And so my, the book is my attempt to tether my son and hopefully maybe the reader to that older, uh, for lack of a better word, tradi word, traditional account of freedom. And the best way I can do that, I'm not, a, I'm not a philosopher or a theologian, I'm a journalist and a storyteller, is to try to poke holes in some of our contemporary certainties. And so I do that by posing 12 questions that are either unasked or 
that our age assumes have been supplanted or made unnecessary, that science has basically pushed them aside or what have you, when in fact they're still pertinent to what it means to be fully free, fully human. And then I explore each of them through the life of a one great thinker, um, some of them kind of predictable, maybe C.S. Lewis, St. Augustine, but others will surprise readers because, you know, they're, they're um, not figures you typically associate with the term tradition. And it's a kind of, you know, it's, it's a genre that I invented in the sense that I pose these questions and then I explore each um, through the narrative and the drama of one life story. So the reader, when he, he or she reads it, will just um, will not be hit thick with philosophy. You're drawn into a story and um, that's what propels each chapter. Yeah, and you end it really on a nice note with a, a very short note to your son and what you hope the book has done. So let, let's talk about those two, those 12 questions. And you laid the book out in two parts. So part one, which is the first six questions, is the things of God. Part two is the things of humankind. So the first question is how do you justify your life? And it does seem to me right now, there is a huge amount of people, especially young people, uh, that can't justify their lives. So they're acting out in all sorts of crazy ways. Right, at their most most extreme, they say that if life is not worth passing on in one way or another, um, AOC um, uh, said some something like that with respect to climate change. You know, mm -hmm. why would you put a child into the world? Um, and that question really is a critique of of scientism, not of science, which is a perfectly noble endeavor that's unlocked lots of useful things and 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 helped unlock the mysteries of really the cosmos and nature but the attitude that would apply um, sci the scientific outlook or the scientific way of looking at the world to the whole of life. Um, and so the reason I start with that question is because I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of young people, especially like you said, think that because we know a lot about the Big Bang or cosmology, uh, it, uh, it, Physic, uh, philosophy and and religion have been made superfluous. You mm -hmm. don't need metaphysics anymore because, you know, we have the Big Bang or we have uh, evolutionary theory. And, uh, you know, what I argue, and that chapter is based on the life of C.S. Lewis, who was a great critic of scientism in the 20th century, is that there are certain questions uh, about, you know, what's beauty or what is beautiful? Why is something beautiful? Why is something ugly? Um, what it means to be fully human, what it means to to fall in love, and so on and so forth, which don't have, they have right or wrong answers, but those right or wrong answers can't be formulated using facts, which mm -hmm. is the product of scientific inquiry. And um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I have to get rid of scientism first if I'm writing this book for my son, because he'll be bombarded with the idea that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson has made Aristotle unnecessary. Yeah, so of course you were writing this during at least a portion of the lockdown and, and COVID and everything else that's going on. And one of the things that we've seen, I think for the last year is just the absolute dis uh, destruction of the elite class when it comes to science, that people no longer trust the experts because the experts basically change their mind every week for the last year and a half. And that, that's really no way to live. I mean, it's okay to change their mind because it's a novel virus and, and you learn new things. What was outrageous about it was to treat the scientific inquiry as this monolithic thing that's written right. in stone. And so if you go, if you run afoul of it, then your voice needs to be censored because frankly, you don't, you're not following the science, Dave. Um, that's the attitude. And, and, and the, also the fact that questions that were ultimately philosophical questions or policy questions, okay, we have this virus, what degree of restrictions is appropriate? Are there other goods besides just preserving life against the novel coronavirus that we should preserve? Those aren't scientific questions. Mm -hmm. And yet a kind of expert class by trying to shoehorn it all into, they, they basically uh, uh, tried to push their policy preferences and their philosophical assumptions as scientific claims, which of course they're not. You know, uh, a, a statesman or a stateswoman dealing with something like the virus has to weigh various things, not just one virus, but also other sources of threat to human life, like loneliness and depression and, and joblessness. Do you think we uh, needed, 
side, yeah. Yeah, do you think we needed sort of a philosopher class that could have been working alongside the scientific class to deal with this? So we have a political class that works yeah. alongside of them, but that we really needed somebody else to discuss those issues uh, I, I wouldn't, alongside. I wouldn't put academic, I, I majored in philosophy and I obviously I'm a, a, a kind of amateur lover of philosophy, so as the book, but I wouldn't put philosophers in charge. I think ultimately it has to be statesmen and stateswomen and, and, and uh, you know, elected bodies, which is that's how our government works. But it would, be, it would have been nice to have had not just Dr. Fauci, but ethicists and, and bioethicists and, and other people who would, who would and, and frankly, uh, you know, pastors and religious figures, because that's an important dimension mm -hmm. of human life. If they were all informed and then a statesman chooses from among them rather than elevating one form of knowing, one form of knowledge, which is perfectly legitimate in its own realm, and, and making it into the sort of uh, idol where, and if you cross it, then you're, you're against science. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about spirituality instead of nonstop yelling, check out our spirituality playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, check out our full episode playlist. They're all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.